Hi there, my name is Clifford Patterson. I'm a senior GIS consultant at PSD Citywide. Welcome to my talk entitled Asset Management with QGIS and PostGIS, Lessons Learned from Canadian Municipalities. Um, at PSD, I am the product lead for something that we call Enterprise GIS. Enterprise GIS is a complete platform as a service. Uh, it's a complete GIS system um, that we offer to our clients. One of the things that's nice about this is that it integrates fully with our enterprise asset management system. And we've been implementing this for many municipalities across the country. Um, and I thought I'd sort of gather up um, some of the lessons that I've learned from doing this and share them with you. And along with that, I'd like to sort of um, uh, be able to offer some some advice in terms of tools and some methodologies that that I've used when setting up um, these systems. So without further ado, let's dive into it. Lesson number one uh, about data management. So this is really the first phase, right? So before collecting new asset data, determine its attributes and associated data types, spatial data type, uh, and where it will live. So this is something that we do with the database specifically. Uh, when we're setting up uh, an enterprise GIS solution, we're setting it up with Postgres, um, which is the relational database management system, and PostGIS, which, which is the spatial extension that connects um, to Postgres. So it's a centralized cloud-based Postgres, PostGIS uh, relational database management system. Um, we try to normalize the data as much as possible uh, just to increase the data integrity. So any data duplication that exists uh, within the tables, we try to eliminate that as they're, they're brought to us. Or if we're creating new data, we try to make sure that it's going to be collected in a way uh, that normalizes the data. Um, the databases are designed with, and we, we, we have a bunch of different constraints and things that we use. So proper data types for, for attribute data. Um, a, a really good example here is when data comes to us, if, if uh, um, we find numbers consistently within a string field, well, obviously we want to cast that to either an integer or a double um, just to make sure that we're going to be able to analyze those data in the future as numbers. Um, and we want to make sure appropriate geometry is used for the type of asset. Um, so if we're talking about something like a soccer field, well, polygon is probably best for that. Uh, but oftentimes we'll only have you know, maybe cent centroid points um, for a lot of these assets. So these are conversations that we often have with the clients to say, you know, what's the best way to represent this within uh, the GIS? Uh, we all always try to move towards the local UTM CRS. Um, whenever possible, um, and and we use not null constraints also uh, whenever possible within the data set. Uh, we use unique constraints, especially with something like the asset ID, which is an alphanumeric code um, that, that allows the GIS database to relate to the asset uh, database. So when we're setting up the tables, we will, we will apply a unique constraint. And what that does, for anybody who doesn't really work directly with relational database management systems, is that basically says to the, the, the database that you can only have unique values within each row of this, um, of this table. So if your first row you put uh, one, um, well, in the second row, you would not be able to put one in that field because one was already taken from the previous. You'd have to put two or three or so on. Um, we also use, not frequently, but sometimes check constraints. I do this sometimes when, when clients are going to be entering some coordinates, maybe in a flat table, and I just make sure that um, you know, they're getting their latitudes and their longitudes not uh, entered correctly. Um, so we might have an example value less than or equal to um, 100. Um, we always have primary key constraints with sequences. Sequences just allow us to, you know, start at one and, and two and three. Um, and those values are automatically populated within the database when we're adding a new row to any of the tables. Um, and the primary key constraint um, is, is established using those. So we also create trigger functions at times. Now I've done a few talks in, uh, about trigger functions where I go in a little more deep uh, into how they're used, but these are basically just used to automatically populate certain fields. Um, you might have the length, the area, or you might have something really cool like the proximity. Um, you might want to know if you have a drain pipe, what's the uh, nearest road, right? And you want to might want to populate a certain field with either the name of the road or the road ID so you can, um, you know, keep it normalized. 
Um, and then we also we use foreign key constraints uh, if required. Um, for example, if you do have an asset and you want to say, um, you know, let's say the ward where this asset is is located, you don't want to have uh, you don't want to duplicate data and have ward one repeated over throughout the table. So you'll actually use a foreign key to refer to your ward table um, um, to enter the ID from that field rather than uh, the name of the ward um, itself. So this is how we pretty much set up uh, any database for our clients now. I always explain that a, a database schema in Postgres is kind of like a file folder. Um, so to start with, we, we spin up a database that has a series of file folders, schemas, um, uh, where we can drop their data. Um, so for everything, as, agriculture, assets, boundaries, and you know most clients might not have uh, data to populate in these, and, and at those times we'll make the decision sort of remove them if we're never going to use them, or keep them if maybe one day uh, we might find some data. It just gives the data some structure. So as opposed to having data like um, uh, based on departments within the organization, it's more um, uh, thematic at this point. Um, so looking at assets, so within the asset schema, you might have tables for things like ball diamonds, blow-offs, catch basins, cemeteries, and so on. So let's then look what would a typical data set look like when we set it up. So look at signs. So signs will have an ID value. Uh, it will be an integer. It'll actually be a sequence. And that's going to be our primary key um, for the table. We'll have something called an asset ID, and that's going to be a varchar. Um, and it's going to be, have, be, again, as I said previously, it'll have that unique constraint placed on it. And then this is where it gets kind of fun with Postgres, right? So um, PostGIS allows you to um, create additional types of data within the database. So we're going to create the geometry uh, for a multipoint. And the 26917 is, of course, the EPSG number. Um, so this is UTM zone 17 north. And then we have a bunch of foreign keys. We have sign category, sign type, material, and color. And the reason why these are foreign keys is that we actually have another table in the database uh, where we have where we store the sign category. So all we're pulling from that is the integer from that, sorry, the ID from that field uh, as an integer and, and inserting it into this table. And same with sign type, material, and color, and et cetera, whatever other fields that we wanna add as attributes. But then we also want to add a little bit of sort of metadata, a little bit of audit um, to, to our table. So what was the date created? That's just entered by default. Um, and you know, it's created now. Uh, and it'll use the now function to enter that timestamp with uh, time zone. Um, and then we have created by, and that's a var char, and the default is the current user. So it'll take the current user if they're doing it with a QGIS, it'll take the username and throw it in there. Well, then what about date modified and modified by? Well, this is where we use a trigger function, right? So the trigger function will act for date modified, will actually use the now, the now function um, within it and it will automatically change that value every single time there's an update or an insert uh, into the table. And same will go with modified by, right? So the username will actually be populated. So if you wanna know who is the last person to change this individual row within the table, well, we would know that. Um, so we this is pretty much how we set up tables for clients and how we set up the database structure uh, itself. But then what about permissions? What about who can have access to the database? Um, so fortunately, user management is wonderful within Postgres. Um, you, we want have to address the questions of like who has read access to the asset data, who has write access. Um, so the way we do this is we create roles uh, for different groups within the organization. And this is usually the first phase of implementation where it's, I'll talk with the clients and find out, okay, so what different groups do we have? And what different types of access should they have to the, uh, to the database itself? So each role has a different level of access. And users become members of one of these roles and inherit these uh, permissions. So here's a little example of how that might work. Um, if we had an engineering role, a planning role, a read-only role, an asset editor role, and an admin role. 
Um, so we've created these rules. These rules on their own do nothing, but these rules are applied to different data sets within the database. So let's say there's some layers associated with uh, the engineering department. Well, we want them to have read and write permission on them. But all layers within uh, the database, we want all staff to have a read-only uh, read ability, right? Um, so even the, those layers that are within the engineering schema, let's just say, um, <clears throat> let's say it's a public work schema, well, we want everybody to be able to at least see things um, like the drains and the manholes and so on. Um, so likewise with planning. Well, planning, uh, let's say planning does nothing to do with asset management in this, this scenario, let's say. Um, well, they should not have the be a member of the asset editor role, but some of the engineers actually do edit some assets. So how do we set this up? Okay, well, our engineering department is a member of, our staff, let's say within the engineering part, department, will be a member of the engineering role, the read-only role, so they can read everything, even the stuff that's not directly part of their, their department, uh, and they're a member of the asset editor role because they handle all the public works um, assets. The planning department, like I said, they want, they should be able to read everything um, so they can create maps and add these layers to the maps, but we don't want them to edit that stuff. But they do have certain layers like the parcel data set where they should have write ability and further, they should be the only ones who have write ability on that. So again, we set this up within the database using a role. The asset management team has read only ability for all the layers, but they have uh, the asset editor role also. And that gives them the ability to edit all assets within the organization. And then we have our admin role. Um, so this is your GIS or IT system administrator who has the ability to pretty much make changes on any layer. Usually they'll have like a super user status where they can create tables, create schemas, uh, modify anything um, they wish. So this is pretty much how we set it up. We set up the database. Um, we set up the tables um, where our asset data are going to live, and then we figure out how we're going to organize it uh, in terms of permissions, who should have access to it, how should they have access to it. And at this point, we're ready. At this point, um, you know, our clients are ready to actually put data within the database. So let's go on to lesson number two, data collection. Um, so a data collection strategy is an integral part of the asset management process. So big questions. So a, a, a data collection strategy must address a bunch of key questions. So such as, you know, how will the data be used? How will the data help to inform decisions? What accuracy and precision uh, is required? Um, how will you collect the spatial data? Are you going to be using like an RTK or a GPS or a total station, um, aerial photos? Are you going to be converting CAD drawings into GIS data or something that's really common in my world uh, being handed a, an Excel table or a CSV file uh, that contains a latitude and longitude um, coordinate? Who will collect the data? So if somebody is going to be going out and collecting new data, who will they, who is going to be doing this work? Are they very well trained? Are we just going to be hiring a bunch of students to run around with the GPS? What kind of GPS are they going to be used? So all these things have to be considered. So some of the helpful tools that we've used for data collection, and this, honestly, I could do a half an hour talking about probably any one of these tools that I, I, I start discussing here. So this is really uh, my little nudge to uh, everyone to, you know, check out some of the QGIS documentation um, for these things and, you know, maybe fiddle around with them a bit just to see how they work but this is one that I love and I say this I think whenever I talk about QGIS I'll talk about forms um, but is the uh, QGIS attribute forms so with these forms you're able to create check boxes drop down menus you can have a date time picker you can have attachments you can have a value map so that's when uh, you just uh, um, set up a list of values that you're allowed to have within the drop down menu and that's your value map you can have a value relation so you could actually pull values from another table uh, so in that scenario where we were talking about signs and materials was sitting in in another table well you could just have a drop down menu that pulls down from that materials table and then inserts the id into your signs table um, you can enforce constraints. So even though we have constraints within our database, you can have more here um, within the front end so that you don't actually get that 
error from the database because the database won't let you write if there's constraints, but we can ha also enforce those on the front end here um, just to make sure you sort of get another error or it turns red, um, you know, doesn't have the checkbox beside it to indicate that the value is acceptable. Um, and one of the things I love the most is that you can create a tabbed interface with conditional logic. Um, now, you don't see this here, but in this uh, uh, screenshot for survey information, I have it set to GPS, and we can put the horizontal accuracy and the vert vertical accuracy, as well as the GPS sa satellite count at the bottom. Um, but if we change that drop down for survey method to something like total station, then we actually have different values that are going to pop up underneath. So you can have conditional logic mixed in here um, uh, to really facilitate the process of data collection uh, and collect good data. This actually supports, you know, uh, data integrity um, overall within your database. So some helpful tools for data collection. Another one is the um, advanced editing features within QGIS. Um, so not only can you do things, there's various tools to create and edit um, complex ge geometries, um, especially if you're splitting parts of a geometry or bringing parts together. Um, all that exists within QGIS. But one of the things that I also really like is the CAD-like tools um, to make precise uh, measurements. Uh, we had a client doing this with their parcel data set as just the process of creating subdivisions. Um, and they're doing that. They have a subdivision layer that they overlay over on top of their um, CAD drawings. And they, that's how they create their subdivisions now as they're doing it all within um, QGIS. So helpful tools, one more. Um, I love this one. So the scenario behind this would be um, we had a client in British Columbia and due to COVID, um, they were working from home, but they actually live in a very small little village and their their internet is, you know, probably barely better than dial up from back in the day. So um, her concern was, how am I going to be able to collect data? How am I going to be able to work with this cloud based database? Um, if uh, I can't connect to it or stay connected to it, or every time I press save, it's gonna take a long time. Well, QGIS has an amazing tool as part of their database package, which creates an offline project. Um, so again, slow internet, poor performance with a cloud-based GIS server. So mu as much as we wanna say, you know, this is, uh, you know, really this is the future of GIS, right? Throw your stuff onto the cloud, everybody can connect to it, especially during these COVID times. Uh, it's an amazing solution, right? For people who might be working from home. Um, but what this does is it creates an offline project um, and it's flawless, it, it works really well. It basically copies all your layers or only the selected features to a local geo package. Um, and then when you're done all your changes, it, you can synchronize all your layers back to the Postgres uh, database. So this is a really handy solution. Um, I don't only use it when I have crummy internet. Sometimes I also do it when um, I have a large amount of features. So if we're dealing with something like 50K plus and making those constant saves or even the process of just zooming in and out um, uh, or panning around your, your map and constantly loading these things from the cloud, it works great. But sometimes, you know, you want it to be just a little bit faster. Well, you create an offline project um, do all the work you need and then synchronize it back to the, the cloud and, and you're good to go. I love rule-based and default symbology within QGIS. Um, QGIS and PostGIS integrate perfectly together. Um, they've sort of both developed um, um, simultaneously, I guess I would say. And one of the great things about this is that we can create rules. This is no different than probably most other GIS systems, right? Is that we can create a series of rules. In this case, I'm just classifying uh, parcel data based on the area. So you don't need to have like an area field within uh, your table. You can just automatically calculate it um, within QGIS. But you can also do other things. You can do buffers. You can do closest point. You can combine. Uh, you can do difference. You can use basically any spatial function as part of the rule. Um, that you're putting together, but but wait, there's more. Um, you can also save whatever style you create as default. And the way this works is, is that if anybody loads this parcel data set now, once it's saved as default, um, within their local QGIS uh, installation, um, it's gonna load on the map with the exact same style 
um, that was defined. And this is great within an enterprise environment because then you know that if anybody is starting uh, to load data, they're going to load it and it's going to look exactly the same um, as it does for, for everyone within the organization. And then you end up with something like this. So if we loaded this as our style for our parcel data set, um, this would load automatically. But more than that, there's other neat things you can do with it. You can create uh, multiple styles associated with one layer. And all this does is it creates a, a table within the public schema of the database. Um, and it's, it's in every single row is a different style. Um, and when QGIS op goes to open up the, 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 um, the properties for a specific uh, table that's loaded, it will actually look into that, that uh, public schema at the style database and it will load whatever styles you have. So you can switch between. So you could have a parcel data set like this, which is your, your standard default. And then you could also have one um, that is just an outline that you use for different cartographic tasks. So the discovery tool, I really like the discovery tool because it does something very simple and it does it very well. Um, it, it allows you to easily search and zoom any layer in a PostGIS, uh, MS SQL, or GeoPackage uh, database. Um, and the way you do it is you basically just set up the configuration for each search. Um, select the uh, data source type, whether it's Postgres or whatever database you have, the name, you wanna apply a name to the search. In this case, I'm searching Windsor Parks. Um, and the connection you have, and I have a connection called EGIS Demo. Uh, what's the schema? So where's the layer? It's been Parks and Rec. What's the table name? It's called Parks. What's the search column? We're searching a column called Park Name. What's the display column like? So what's actually going to show up when we search? And we're going to search for, we're going to show Park Name. And then the last thing, you, all you have to do is say, what's the geometry field? And you saw that when we're setting up our table, we always call the geometry field Geom. Um, and what happens is this, right? Is that you see at the top here, um, we have the discovery toolbar and we can just search for whatever park we want and it will zoom in and center um, whatever result we click on. It will turn it red and it stays red for about three seconds and then, and then fades. Sounds simple, but what's nice is you can create a series of drop downs here. So this is only the Windsor Park search that I've done. Um, you can s create another one to search for parcel roll numbers. Uh, you can create another one that's going to search for um, different roads within your municipality um, or different sewer lines based on a certain numeric code. You can search multiple fields within an individual table as well. Um, so really handy tool for the, the process of updating data because if when a client already has an existing data set and they know that now they need to either retire a certain point from the map or delete it outright um, because some construction has happened and it needs to be moved, it's nice to be able to just search for those features quickly and easily um, and, and get your tasks uh, done. Another thing that has been helpful for a lot of clients is uh, Citywide's uh, mobile apps, uh, especially citywide asset collector. Um, you're able to collect and update asset data in the field with any mobile device, either iOS or, or Android. Uh, you can also manage work orders, inspections, route patrols, etc. And, and we're putting a lot of time and effort into developing this because this is something that our clients really use quite a bit. But for EGIS clients, it's kind of cool because any changes made to the geometry uh, is saved right back to the EGIS uh, PostGIS uh, database. So lesson three, uh, using and sharing data. Uh, when done right, asset data can be accessible both internally and externally through a number of different uh, clients. So how do we have this all set up? Well, I just want to go through the, the structure of, of the EGIS system, right? So we have a whole bunch of data. Um, and this is usually where I start with a client is that they have a ton of asset data, aerial photos, elevation data, open data um, from either the province or the federal government. And then there's the citywide EGIS server. Um, so the server itself has GeoServer, Postgres, and PostGIS uh, installed as well as other software. And it's a cloud-based server. So we put all the data into this, into this server and uh, then we can share it out to internal users via QGIS. And we also use another application sometimes for mobile data collection called QField. 
Uh, but what else can we do? Well, we also serve it out to the citywide GIS module. And with that, we can use it in the asset manager module, the maintenance management module, and also asset collector. So we can do things in the field. Um, so the, the, the EGIS server really becomes a sort of central brain in the operation, at least as far as it, go, as far as it goes with, with geospatial data. So with that in mind, um, you know, how, what, what, when we're at that phase where we're using and sharing the data, um, what can we do? Well, one thing that, that is nice now is that we have uh, complete integration with the citywide GIS. Um, so what we can do is we can create, modify, delete features in either um, citywide, QGIS, or really any, um, any client that can, you know, consume uh, OGC uh, standard or OGC compliant services, or can connect directly to a PostGIS server. So it's what this is is really a nice solution for both power and casual users. And this is what I find people are mostly doing, right? Is that they're power users or they're, you know, users that have some experience using GIS um, will move towards QGIS, right? Um, you know, a powerful desktop. GIS where they can do a lot and they can use those advanced tools. And what we're finding is that the, you know, the users that might have, you know, a little bit of experience, they understand what a map is, um, but they're a little intimidated by all the tools and options and, and things you can do within QGIS. Well, they might do their editing within Citywide itself on the kind of simplified web map application. So what's nice about that is that we have uh, really both a multi-user and a multi-client editing opportunity here. Um, so whatever the client feels comfortable with, they can use and edit the data. And all those edits, of course, go back into the Postgres database. Um, so what about sharing? What about sharing? Okay, well, we we use GeoServer, which is um, shares uh, geospatial data with OGC compliant web services. Um, so data can be easily shared to virtually any client that supports um, these services. So we're talking web, desktop, um, mobile, uh, you know, you can even plug them into, um, you know, ETL processes um, using whatever scripting language you're using. You can pull the data from, from GeoServer this way. So GeoServer's data uh, <coughs> serves data as WMTS, WMS, uh, CSW, WCS, WFS, and WFST, um, and WPS. Um, so depending on how these connections are made, you can have read and or write permissions um, with this. So, sorry, what's that? One, one other point I want to make about this is that this is nice because there are some desktop clients that might not uh, be able to do as much as QGIS can with a, with a PostGIS connection. Well, you can connect with a WFST uh, connection. So as long as the, the desktop client has the ability to consume um, these web services, then you can, you can connect uh, directly to this via GeoServer. So lesson number four, last one, um, deleting or retiring data. Um, a strategy is definitely needed for data that reaches end of life. And this is with our clients that are a little more mature and have been doing um, uh, with their asset management strategy. And maybe they've been doing this for quite a few years and they're getting to the point where they have data that they need to get rid of. And a good example would be some construction takes place and um, all of a sudden the um, <clears throat> the manhole that was once, once here is no longer here because now this is a park or something. Um, so the very simple solution is to say goodbye, um, is just deleting data, right? So with the relational database management system, we can grant the ability to delete or even truncate an entire table. So that's deleting every single row um, within the table. So we are careful with that permission, right? You don't want, you want to make sure not every user has the ability to actually delete. What's nice is that we can lock that down. So deletions and truncations from the Postgres, from Postgres are permanent and irreversible without a data backup. So once it's gone, it's gone. Um, so the other option would be the option number two, um, which is kind of creating like a soft deletions within, um, within QGIS, right? And the way we normally do this is we can use rule-based symbology to essentially mask out retired features. So if there was a manhole that we want to not appear um, on a map, again, we can use rule-based uh, logic to eliminate that 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 manhole, and we can just create a list and say any any ID within this list 
don't display it on a map. Um, so what's nice is that we'll add a deleted field uh, to differentiate uh, between active and inactive asset data, right? So this will be a simple just var char field and the default value will be false. And if it's true, that means it's deleted. Um, and what's nice about this is that even when you're serving the data through GeoServer, um, it uses something called a CQL filter. Um, and you can use that to avoid sharing soft deleted features within the web service. So as you're setting up the layer, there's actually the option to do that. So what's the third option? Well, option number three, we can retire a table or row uh, really easily within the database. Um, so we can use the database manager within QGIS um, and that allows us to manage schemas, tables, and other objects um, within the database. Um, so we can run SQL, SQL statements and create query layers. We can replicate rows or entire, entire tables um, within the database uh, to a dedicated schema. And we can export data from the database using Database Manager in any vector format. Um, so this is a really handy um, tool within QGIS. It allows you to basically manage your entire database. And this is something we do quite often, right? We'll create a sort of retired schema and then just move data um, to that retired schema whenever possible. We might, might be moving individual rows. We might be moving an entire table if we've received new data. Uh, so instead of deleting it, it's not very large and it's not big to back up over the years, right? Um, the other option, of course, we can just export. If you just want to keep a local copy of it and say, okay, once I have it exported, we're going to put it within our file system and it's going to be backed up and, and, and kept forever, we can delete it off the database at this point. So whatever works for your organization, but definitely think through those those, those that process of deletion, right? Um, so with that said, contact us. Um, um, if you want to chat a little bit more about this, I'm always willing to, um, you know, give a demo uh, of some of these tools. If you ever want to just see how some of this actually works in reality, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you. And thanks a lot.